What's up, everyone? Welcome to Lord Expectations. Thanks for lowering your expectations and hanging out with me here. I do appreciate it. In the last video in this series, we attempted to burn waste engine oil in my diesel heater that is modified to do such things. In this video, we are going to attempt to burn automatic transmission fluid. In the last video, we weighed the ash that was left over afterwards and after burning six liters of waste engine oil in 54 hours, we were left with 31 grams of ash. We're gonna perform the same test with the same setup and because I know all of you haven't seen all of those videos, I'm going to briefly show you the chamber and uh, kind of how it works. First of all, we have a chamber. It's your basic standard burn chamber. The fuel goes into here and burns exactly the same way that it would in your heater. The difference being we have another piece off of another burn chamber that actually slides in the end of the tube. And then we have a hole through the side of the heat exchanger and then into the tube. And that feeds waste engine oil or in today's test, waste ATF into this hole. That way it is preheated and it also gives us a nice easy piece to remove so that we can clean it out. This is going to be quite a long video. I can promise you guys that. If you stick around all the way to the end, I will share some of my ideas for the next generation burn chamber. I've already started to work on it and if you watch that, then maybe you can give me some of your ideas on how I can make improvements on it as well. What's inside the box, Joel? I'm glad you asked. If you guys are looking to purchase your very own diesel heater and you want something simple and basic that will just work at a really good price, this is a $119 Canadian for this Beaver 5 kilowatt heater. I will be making a full video on this heater, but I wanted to let you guys know about it now. If you're interested, there will be an affiliate link as well as a discount code in the description below. I'm putting this back together for the automatic transmission fluid test. It is going to go back together exactly the same way it was for the previous test with waste engine oil. As you guys can see, it's not terribly clean, but that is not going to matter for this test. So let's, let's get this back together and get it set up. I'm really excited to see what the ATF is going to do. A lot of people seem to think that it is going to work really well. I'm cleaning all the nasty out of the oil tank and replacing my filters. This is the old filter. I had told a bunch of people that this was 80 micron. It's not. I was mistaken. This is my 80 micron filter. I use quite a few of these on lawnmowers, but this one, I don't actually know what it is. It's basically a plastic mesh. This transmission fluid was drained out of my truck this past summer, and it's pretty nasty. I'm not sure if we're going to see any red tint to it at all but i'm going to start pouring and we will see it's pretty brown looking for some reason it hurts me to do this we are going to use some new stuff just to make sure we're topped up here right up to that line whoops mr spilly pants here I had a few people suggest dangling a magnet into the tank and my response to that, that it was a really good idea and why I was wondering why I hadn't thought of that. And when I was about to do it, I realized there's actually two reasons. One is that I wanted to use this big magnet and it doesn't fit in there. But the second reason is that the fuel outlet is metal and I'm worried that my magnet is going to stick to the outlet and block it off. I'm now going to attempt to fire this thing up. I'm not sure if I have everything hooked up correctly, but I guess we'll find out. I know not everyone has been following along since the beginning, so I'm going to walk you guys through this pretty quickly. I've got a tank with ATF in it over here. The outlet of the tank has a magnet to try to stop any metal particles from getting through. And I've also got a fuel filter that goes into a valve. Right here, I have a fresh diesel tank that goes into a valve and meets up with the ATF line. It is teed off and that goes through to the fuel pump. This pump is connected to an ECU from a two kilowatt heater. The two kilowatt heater is sitting here, probably just hidden behind the air pump, which we'll get to later. The thermostat, the thermistor, thermocouple, 
heat sensor off of the two kilowatt is connected to a bolt on the end of the five kilowatt so that it thinks that it's actually running. It needs to see heat to continue running. So that's why that is set up that way. Uh, now, what do we have? We have another diesel container that is up on the shelf. That's what this line is. I've got a dripper to indicate how much fuel is actually flowing so I can regulate the fuel flow. The reason why I'm not going through a pump is because I don't have a way to control the pump speed independently of the fan. And so the eight kilowatt controller from the Max Peating Rods heater is controlling just the fan speed on this. And then I am modulating or controlling the fuel drip with a valve that is right here. So this is a needle valve that I will be using to control fuel into the primary chamber. The secondary chamber will get fed from the pump that is connected to the two kilowatt heater and the fuel gets driven in by this air pump. The, this is an aquarium pump. It's 110 volts, uh, 50 watts or something like that. So now enough talking, I am going to try to fire this up. In order to do that, I power up the eight kilowatt. I hit the power button. You'll hear the fan start spinning. Hopefully, error seven. What is error seven? Oh, I know what that is. I have the motor and the heat sensor hooked up backwards. I thought I might. This is actually a little bit of a complicated process because the two kilowatt heater won't start or won't attempt to start if it sees over 40 degrees Celsius on the sensor, but it will also not start if it doesn't warm up quickly enough. So I need to make sure that this heater is actually fired up before I try to start the two kilowatt or it won't build heat quickly enough. Oh, shut up, get it done, Joel. All right, let's get some fuel flowing. Okay, we should be getting fuel in there. There we go. I made a bit of a mistake. I crimped off the fuel line here instead of crimping it off between the pump and the T. So what has happened is the ATF has actually backed up into this line. So now we're probably going to get a big plume of smoke while I try to correct this problem. For anyone who might be keeping track, the test started at 4 p.m. on Monday, February 19th. We are now 16 minutes in and I have the two kilowatt feeding at setting four. I'm gonna crank it up to setting five. The temperature is 231 Celsius. Right now I'm not counting out the drip rate. I just have it set to something reasonable. I'm trying to make sure that the temperature stays nice and hot. I'm going to try to get the two kilowatt heater set to setting six to feed the ATF in uh, before I start trying to turn back the diesel. So hopefully that works. Less than an hour in and I've already screwed up twice. I think the first time I accidentally pressed the power button on the two kilowatt heater while reorganizing some stuff. This time I'm not sure what happened other than I was playing with the diesel drip rate. I was actually shut the diesel off altogether to see if it would just run on the ATF. And it seemed to be working. Well, I'll just stop there. It seemed to be working at first and then the temperature dropped. And then for some reason, the eight kilowatt heater or the max peating rods ECU just decided to stop the fan. 
So the fan stopped dead and smoke started coming out the inlet. I don't know if I'd believe this if I didn't see it for myself, but I've got the drip rate set to about 48 drips a minute, as you guys can see there. The ATF is being set at, fed, fed rather, at setting six on the two kilowatt heater. This is exactly how I had it set up for engine oil and was producing about 130 parts per million, 140 parts per million of carbon monoxide the battery's gonna die any second here but let's see if we can get a reading for you guys a high of 32 I saw 33 parts per million as the highest reading it is now just past midnight, 12.15 a.m. and it is looking really promising for the ATF so far of course, it could go sideways really quickly, but so far it looks good. Temperature in here is 17.5 degrees Celsius. The heater has been running flawlessly. It was kind of a rough start, but it is working really well now. I've got the drip rate of the diesel set to 48 drips a minute. The two kilowatt is pumping in ATF at uh, setting six, so I don't know exactly what Hertz rate that is. We have consumed one liter, almost exactly one liter of ATF and a little over two liters of uh, diesel. The temperature has been really stable. It's currently at 212. So it's fluctuating between 210 and 215, somewhere in there. Twelve point five, that's a little chilly. I tell you what folks, burning ATF sure doesn't make for exciting footage because it's pretty uneventful. I am now four and a half hours into my second day of testing, which means 12 and a half hours into the test. The temperature is pretty stable. I just checked the carbon monoxide level. 17, 18, it went up to 21 earlier. Now it's the highest it's gone is 18. That is ridiculously low. Actually, we need to add fuel right now because we are down to the one liter mark. So we've consumed two liters of diesel and about one and a half liters of the ATF. With the waste motor oil testing, I was running it most of the time at setting five and I turned it up every now and then to setting six. And this I'm running it at setting six. I have been the whole time and the carbon monoxide is low. So I'm thinking I might crank it up to setting seven. It is currently 7 p.m. on day number two, which means we are 16 hours into testing the ATF. The temperature in my garage is 20 degrees Celsius, which is awesome. I like it warm. And yeah, the heater is working flawlessly. No drama whatsoever, except for something that I did with it a short while ago. I don't really like how this line hangs in front of the heat outlet and I was trying to hang it behind this. So I grabbed the line and I pulled it over. And when I did that, it kinked here and I didn't notice it right away. So the ATF and the air wasn't going in. And then when I noticed that I had kinked it, I unkinked it and all the ATF shot in and it ran really rich for a few seconds. Like really, really smoky rich. I don't know if I've updated you guys on this, but I did decide to crank up the uh, ATF input up to setting seven on the two kilowatt controller. And the reason why I decided to do that is because the carbon monoxide was very low and we can get a little bit more heat out of it burn a little bit more ATF, ATF more quickly and yeah, not have to wait as long. 
It is almost 1 a.m. I'm getting ready to shut the heater down and I thought I would share this with you guys. I don't know what's going on, but the heater is making a lot of heat, working really well. It's burning clean. I just checked the exhaust and it seems... Oh, we got an alarm. Is this TVOC? Oh, yeah. TVOCs is poor. I wonder where they're coming from. I'm wondering if there's some diesel. Oh, the jerry can of diesel is sitting right below it. I've got jerry cans all over the place here. Yeah, it's down to good now. So the air quality is good here. I'm in between the two jerry cans. <laughs> Okay, let's try that again. The heater for some reason has been pumping out a ridiculous amount of heat. It is 249 degrees Celsius. I do have the two kilowatt, so the ATF feeding at setting seven, which I believe is 1.8 Hertz. Uh, I've burnt approximately two and a half liters of ATF and about three and a third maybe three and a third liters of diesel the drip rate is currently 44 drips per minute yesterday it was 48 drips per minute so i'm actually running less diesel more atf today than i was yesterday and the heat is considerably higher that's good it is Wednesday, February 21st, and I had the heater running for about 20 minutes. And then, yeah, the Max Peating Rods ECU decided to shut itself off. It's actually done this a few times now, and I'm not really sure why. It is now 2.30 p.m. on the third day of testing, and I have consumed four liters of diesel. I'm now going to add to the diesel so that we can get it back up to the well, to get it back up to a place where I can keep track of it. We are 27 hours into the test on day number three, and I just added two liters of ATF to the waste oil container. And the temperature on the heater is 234 Celsius. It's a bit of a struggle to get the temperature up, but once it gets up, it seems fairly stable. It is currently 1 a.m. The heater has been running for a total of 36 hours and it is just about time to shut it down i'm going to turn off the atf and turn on the diesel let it run that way for a few minutes i've just been using it to heat my garage while i work on my truck i've actually decided to rip the heater out and install it in the way that it should have been in the first place it is not finished no it's not safe yet i need to put some stuff around the exhaust but i'll show you what i've done so far The heater was on the other side of the truck in the back of the cap or under the cap. And now I've made this bracket and mounted it here. And the hot air will blow directly up at the windshield or kind of up into this area, which is very close to the windshield. And the exhaust and the inlet both go through the floor. So that makes it much quieter. This is for another video though. Why am I talking about this? The temperature in my garage is a toasty 19.5 degrees Celsius. It is the end of day number four, I believe. It is 1 a.m. or coming up on 1 a.m. And we are almost out of ATF. We are at hour 50 now. So we might get another four hours. The last test was 54 hours, but ultimately what I'm looking for is to consume six liters of oil which will be when all of this ATF is gone. I said oil, ATF. That very likely means that the next thing that you guys will see is me saying that this thing is finally out of fuel and that we're gonna take it apart and look inside. It has been running fairly consistently. The temperature is 212, so a little bit lower than normal, but there's still no smoke. Carbon monoxide is reasonable and uh, I haven't had any real problems. 
Day number five, and I started the test at 1.30 p.m. because I was doing some other stuff, and it is currently 5.12. By the time I get this sorted out, it will be 5.30, and I will have to tally up how many hours it is. So, yeah, very curious to see what that chamber looks like. I now have the heater over on the bench and I'm about to pull it apart, but before I do, I wanted to make sure to mention that I've consumed almost exactly six liters of ATF and about 8.2 liters of diesel. Now, I did leave the diesel run for quite a while after the ATF ran out. I was actually in the house while the ATF ran out. This video is probably going to be ridiculously long. It's probably already ridiculously long. Okay, so is this, oh, that's stuck. Oh, it's because it cooled off. Because it completely cooled off and I tightened it when it was hot. <laughs> Holy, I had no idea it was going to be that difficult. Whatever the case, nothing crazy looking there. Okay, I am first going to take a look inside of the heat exchanger. And I can tell you guys, there's not nearly as much stuff as there was Oh wow, it's very dry though. I was gonna say, not nearly as much stuff as there was with the waste engine oil. This is what it looks like after shaking some of the debris out. That's where the fuel line comes through. And this is over by the exhaust. Now, this is what I'm really interested in. And I can already see by looking through the fuel hole that we do have a substantial amount of stuff in there. You can see we have a little wisp of carbon on the outside. Now let's take a look inside for the first... Oh, wow. Okay, that is not what I expected. Looking in through the fuel hole, I thought for sure it was going to be completely plugged up. This is pretty incredible. I'm sure the camera makes it look worse than it is, too. I'm sure the iPhone makes it look worse than it is. I will now use the same special baffle removing tool that I used in the last test. That's this bolt to see with how much difficulty it comes out with. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I don't know if you guys remember the ordeal of getting the last one out. It took about five minutes to get out and clean the other one. And this, yeah, it just fell out. The primary burn chamber or the actual burn chamber is in perfect condition. We got some crud in there just from moving the heater around after shutdown. And this, that is really good. This is after six liters of ATF, which is somewhere around 56 hours, 58 hours of runtime. The stainless steel mesh definitely took a real kicking. Not much left of it. But this is going to be very easy to clean. I want to just weigh the ash, but the stainless steel mesh is going to get, yeah, it's going to be part of the ash pile. So that's how easy it is to clean out. That is truly incredible. I think most of this stuff is actually wear material out of the transmission. Some of it is oxides. This is all that's left of six liters of ATF. You can see it was starting to clog up. So the air probably wasn't doing much at the end. 
Wow. Okay, let's crush this up. See, see what's in there. Not nearly as strongly magnetic as the ash from the last stuff. Okay, let's try to crush this up. This, wow. Wow. I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have my work cut out for me, editing out all the random wows and nonsense. Whatever this is looks and feels like welding slag and it crushes up the same. It's kind of almost like volcanic rock or something. It's quite brittle and you can kind of crush it up and it just turns into dust. So I thought maybe it was some sort of metal. It might be some sort of metal oxide. One piece of paper towel. Tear it out. Okay, zero grams. Let's put this on. The other one was 31 grams and this is six grams. And I guarantee you a bunch of this stuff is from the mesh. You can actually see the mesh stuck in there, which is probably a few grams. You can see by looking at this, the mesh completely fell apart. Even if we weigh the entire mesh and everything, I'm pretty certain it won't be 31 grams. 10 grams even with the mesh. <laughs> so, yeah, not just a little bit different, a lot different than the engine oil. This video is already quite long. I did promise you guys that I would talk about my new chamber design, so we're gonna do that. I tried recording this clip once already and it turned into an eight minute rant, so I'm gonna try to keep it a little bit shorter. The original chamber had this piece that dropped in and the problem with it is that it has a hole straight through, so when the gases are coming through and burning the oil, they're just pushing that out before it's actually completely burning inside of the tube. So what I'm doing is taking this piece, which is a new chamber that I hacked apart and completely destroyed, you're welcome. And this is now going to drop inside of the chamber. Difference being that it has this end cap on it and that directs the air so that it actually blows out towards the walls of the chamber. And so that is going to hopefully direct the air so that we get a better mixing of the fuel vapors and the oxygen that is coming through. So that's gonna go in there like that. The next improvement we're gonna make is we're going to put a baffle in there. I believe the idea of the baffle is to kind of trap gases so they mix together better and to guide the gases in a very specific way. So we're gonna come up with some sort of way to hold that in there. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do it yet. The next modification we're gonna make is on the fuel injector or the fuel nozzle. <clears throat> the way that I had it before is just this bolt with a hole directly through it. And then we had a tube soldered in the end of it. Well, what I'm planning on doing this time is using a slightly bigger bolt and not drilling all the way through. So the air won't go out the end, the fuel won't go out the end. I'm gonna drill most of the way through and then drill three or four holes in one side of the bolt. And that way we can actually get it to stick part way into the chamber and inject the fuel and air in the same direction as the spiral of the air. So the air will come in in a counterclockwise direction. This will be sitting in there with those holes pointed in the right direction to assist with that counterclockwise spin of the air. Again, hopefully mixing things together a little bit better. That's all I'm gonna say about it before I screw this clip up. 
If you guys have ideas, let me know what they are in the comment section below. I know a bunch of people are gonna say to use the wick in there and I do have the original wick. If you insist on it, I might try that, but I'm pretty sure it's just gonna be a place for ash and soot to gather. As we've seen with the mesh on this one, nothing stuck to the metal itself, but all kinds of stuck stuff stuck to the mesh. So I think I wanna try it without the mesh at first. I'm not even sure if this is gonna run this way. It might be way too much restriction, but I think we should give it a try. And if it doesn't work, we'll make some modifications and keep modifying and modifying and modifying till we get something that works. Was this actually a fair comparison between the waste engine oil and ATF? Well, not really, because in this test, we used a brand new 80 micron filter, as well as a magnet placed by the outlet of the container the whole time. And that was definitely not the test for the waste engine oil. That being said, the leftovers or the crud that was left over after the test was very different, not just in volume and in mass, but the actual makeup of the material. What was left over after the waste engine oil test was a little bit of metal oxide, about five grams, I believe, of some metallic stuff, and then mostly ash. The difference being in the ATF, what we were left with was basically some sort of slag. I believe that is from wear materials inside of the transmission. This, me me this makes a big difference because the ATF itself appears to be burning very clean. I think that this would actually work well in a standard diesel heater if you filter it very well, meaning down to like one micron or used a centrifuge, and if you preheated your chamber by starting it on diesel and then switching over to the ATF because you are going to need to get it hot enough. There is a caveat and that is if you have stuff building up inside of your standard chamber, it's going to do so behind that uh, baffle and it's going to be very hard to get at to clean out. You guys saw how hard this stuff was. It's basically like a glass or volcanic rock. And so if that stuff gets trapped behind the baffle, good luck cleaning it out. You're probably gonna want a spare burn chamber on hand if you're going to attempt to do this, but I think it's worth a shot. That's gonna do it for this one. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please remember to leave a thumbs up on the video. And if you wanna see more nonsense like this, be sure to subscribe. If you're interested in supporting me on Patreon, there is a link in the description below, as well as a link to the heater that I mentioned earlier and a discount code. That is gonna do it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.